James. Sydney, Australia. And we're here to look back over a momentous year in the company of a legendary Australia. Join Clive James as he slips easily into Australian national costume and then skims speedily across Sydney Harbour, acknowledging the greetings of his many fans. <laughs> Destination, a fabulous New Year party at Balmoral Beach. Let's celebrate! Thank you, the Minogue family formation dancers. <laughs> With Europe in the grip of Maastricht, Britain in the grip of recession, and various members of the royal family in the grip of the wrong people, <laughs> what a better part of the world to be than Sydney, Australia? We've got a whole year to look back on tonight, and it looks a lot better from 12,000 miles away. As usual, I'll be giving out our annual awards, including the prestigious awards for Man and Woman of the Year. And helping me do so will be Australia's truly super, supermodel, Elle McPherson, someone it's worth coming 12,000 miles to meet, even if you have to swim. We'll be <laughs> meeting Elle later. First, let's go back to the beginning of a tempestuous year. It started, as always, with January, when the world was in the safe hands of an inspiring lineup of world leaders, every one of them a byword for integrity. They were Johnny the Gimp Major, <laughs> Scarface Frank Mitterrand, <laughs> Boris Potatoes Yeltsin, <laughs> Helmet the Hitman Cole, <laughs> Gentleman George Bushinsky, some torpedo from Canada, and Mr. Mickey the Mouse Miyazawa from Tokyo. <laughs> Yes, it was the new world order, and nowhere did it look more promising than in Britain, where everyone was confidently predicting the forthcoming economic recovery. But hopes were dashed when the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Mr Norman Lamont, announced catastrophic news. I will not be resigning. <laughs> America's President Bush flew to Japan, where he was greeted by Prime Minister Miyazawa, who had a special announcement to make. The meal was a gastronomic triumph. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was a gastric disaster. Mr. Bush's successful survival of the blowfish sashimi was greeted with spontaneous applause by the Japanese government official spontaneous applause department. <laughs> 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 
Next morning, Prime Minister Miyazawa had another special announcement to make. <laughs> His appetite for Japan undimmed, President Bush then paid a sad farewell to the land of the rising sun. <laughs> the Queen Mother flew to Berlin in her capacity as honorary colonel of her favorite regiment, the Queen Mother's own armed gardening squad. She solemnly handed out boxes of parsley seedlings in a traditional ceremony known as passing out the parsley. <laughs> After the parsley had been passed out, past parsley recipients passed by in the traditional parsley passing out parade. <laughs> After years of pretending to be bald, Elton John finally abandoned all deception and let his hair grow. It's no use, he confessed, I can't go on with the masquerade. The truth is, I'm hairy. <laughs> Russia's President Yeltsin visited Britain in order to study a country in worse shape than his. He was received by Britain's Prime Minister Major, whose dazzling oratory also enthralled his Foreign Secretary, Mr. Douglas Hurd. I was glad to have the opportunity today to welcome the arms control initiative taken by President... Mr. Hurd said later, there's something about the way John speaks <laughs> that makes you realize how precious life is. Inspired, Mr. Yeltsin left for home. He was seen off by Mr. Lamont with some good advice about paying off Russia's balance of payments deficit with an access card. <laughs> At the airport, Mr. Yeltsin said goodbye to the British police who had guarded him. He demonstrated that he, like them, was a Freemason. <laughs> Back in Russia, Mr. Yeltsin was greeted by two members of his inner cabinet. One of them was a member of the same Masonic Lodge, and the other one wasn't. <laughs> there was a sensation in America when Warren Beatty at last got married and fathered his first child. The happy father said, I finally found her, a woman I hadn't slept with already. <laughs> In Washington, President Bush had still not fully recovered from his Japanese experience. Here. Can I come in the play? Will you tell he me booked stuff? himself into a rehabilitation center <laughs> for children under seven and politicians over 70. There he spent most of the day in a cardboard box pretending he was the president of the United States, <laughs> calling up important people on the telephone. The big media event of the month was Melvin Bragg's A Time to Dance. An ironic title because the leading players had no time to dance at all since they were too busy enjoying sexual congress, often outdoors on wet grass in all weathers. A Time to Dance was the story of a mature Cumbrian novelist and television millionaire who won the heart of a young girl by pointing out to her all the locations in which he had written his earlier novels. <laughs> I wrote a novel over there, he told her, and one over there, another one there and I wrote a really long one over there, <laughs> and a really huge one over there. He told her that his most taxing task had been to keep the novels coming, even after he'd been asked to anchor the most important arts program on British television. She told him she was very impressed by his self-sacrifice, and she was worried that she had nothing to offer him in return. For a moment, he thought he had lost her, frightened her with his display of mature Cumbrian authority. But no, she replied she had many gifts to offer, and she decided to give him one. <laughs> but first she had to get rid of his awful anorak. <laughs> and that terrible tie. <laughs> now at last, there was nothing to stop them doing what she knew they had to do. Yes, now they could settle down for a long discussion on the influence of the northern landscape on the contemporary British novel, with particular reference to television adaptations financed and screened by the British Broadcasting Corporation. <laughs> After... After ludicrous press rumours about the allegedly unstable marriages of her children, Her Majesty the Queen cleverly established a high-powered public relations unit 
which swung smoothly into action by starting a rumour that the Princess of Wales had a secret friendship with an anonymous, handsome, young Australian. At first, suspicion naturally fell on my soul. <laughs> But then attention veered to an even more attractive candidate. Asked by telephone whether it was true that he'd been delivered to Kensington Palace in a Harrods hamper at midnight, he exploded in a fury of sarcastic Australian abuse. Um, well, I suppose... I mean, that's quite a, an interesting question. <laughs> would this angry bluster be enough to put Fleet Street off the scent? We would see. The forthcoming economic recovery was well on its way until it received yet another shattering blow. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not going to resign. <laughs> All the Chancellor needed was a bit more time. In February, it became clear that 1992 would be the year of the virile politician. In America, Democratic presidential candidate Bill Clinton was a four-foot-two-inch, bald, tone-deaf, celibate pensioner <laughs> until his public relations people hit on the brilliant idea of starting a rumor that he'd had an affair with a blonde singer called Jennifer Flowers. The Clinton team then persuaded Jennifer Flowers to confirm the rumor. Yes, I was Bill Clinton's lover for 12 years. Clinton was encouraged to deny it as unconvincingly as possible. She didn't tell the truth. <laughs> Even Clinton's wife found him attractive, now that his advisers had supplied him with elevator shoes, wig, saxophone lessons, and a reputation for seducing blondes. Lip readers reported that even in public, Hillary was whispering exciting suggestions in his ear. How would you like to cover me in frozen yogurt and lick it off before it melts, she asked him. At a press conference the next day, the lip readers noticed that she was at it again. I know where there's lots of frozen yogurt on the point of melting, she told him. Would you like a taste? Clinton did his best to remain calm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Within minutes, they were down at the local frozen yogurt parlor, choosing which flavor they'd be taking home. They didn't tell the press what they were going to do with it, but Clinton gave a broad hint. Absolutely. This is terrific. <laughs> Singing star Michael Jackson emerged from his 50th plastic surgery operation to embark on a new world tour. His first stop was Sierra Leone, a land largely populated, like most countries in Africa, by black people. Michael said it was good to go somewhere where people still had respect for a white man. <laughs> Unfortunately, the hot African sun had a disastrous effect on Michael's hair, which melted and ran down his face. <laughs> In America, President Bush received a state visit from President Boris Yeltsin of Russia, who was in urgent need of money after following Mr. Lamont's advice about putting the Russian economy on access. President Bush wore a U.S. Marine's fur-lined thermoplastic anorak, Mr. Yeltsin wore something made out of old potato skins. <laughs> but Yeltsin won international attention when he later appeared wearing the new Russia's first successful commercial product made in one of the newly converted defense factories. It was the MiG-29 surface-to-air better sweater for the fuller figure. We have to get it silly. Mr. Yeltsin then went to France. He was welcomed by President Mitterrand, several top service personnel, and a man who had taken the wrong turning while looking for the baggage carousel.
In this year of the virile politician, the Queen came to Australia, where all men are virile. Prime Minister Keating, perhaps the most virile of all politicians, greeted her warmly. He later denied that he had shown the Queen anything more than his warm support, which he had previously worn in a five-a-side rugby match that morning. <laughs> The climax of the Queen's visit was a recital of Australian classical music. <laughs> Isn't that one of young Jason Donovan's tunes, said the Queen? My daughter-in-law thinks he is wonderful. <laughs> In the year of the virile politician, France's President Mitterrand was uncomfortably aware that at the age of 108, he was not perceived as a sex symbol. He went on television to rectify matters. <laughs> Britain's Prime Minister John Major and Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd went to the United Nations. The ending of the Cold War has raised hopes for a safer, more equitable, and more humane... Douglas Hurd sat behind the Prime Minister and said later that he hadn't heard John in such entertaining form <laughs> since the hilarious night he dreamed up the phrase forthcoming economic recovery. The Japanese Prime Minister agreed. In Hollywood, Elizabeth Taylor spent her 60th birthday quietly with a few close friends. The venue was Disneyland, because Miss Taylor had always loved Disney characters. I used to like Goofy best, she said, but now I've got Larry. <laughs> the Queen's PR unit sent the Prince and Princess of Wales on a state visit to India, with instructions to stage a passionate public reconciliation. The manoeuvre was a triumphant success. The Bombay Times commented, my goodness, what a passionate public reconciliation. <laughs> As the tour moved on from Hyderabad to Delhi, the Queen's PR unit laid on another chance for the royal couple to display their tender devotion. After inspecting a small detachment of C Platoon, of G Company, of the 2nd Battalion, the 348th Rajputi Rifles, Territorial Division, Mondays and Fridays if fine, <laughs> the Prince of Wales had comparatively little trouble in picking out his wife in the lineup of waiting dignitaries. <laughs> She was the short one in the black scarf. <laughs> and so a blissful tour of India came to an end. But the abiding memory for all those who accompanied the happy couple was the Princess of Wales' secret smile. It was the secret smile of someone who knows that back in Britain, Jason Donovan is about to release a new album called Waiting for Squidgy. <laughs> Time for our first quiz question of the year. Have you got your pencils ready? Here it comes. Both these women have a platonic relationship with the Prince of Wales, but only one of them dances to Guns N' Roses in a bath towel. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> and finally, for February, came news from the Middle East about exotic Palestinian beauty Yasmin Arafat. <laughs> Yasmin had a very special announcement to make. She was getting married. Little did Yasmin know that her chosen bridegroom was, in fact, Lieutenant Colonel Allardyce Price Carruthers, DSO, Master of Disguise. <laughs> Time now for the first of our awards for 1992. And here to present it is my co-host for this evening, Australia's most radiant testimonial to a healthy diet of sun, sand and surf, supermodel and fashion tycoon, the awe-inspiring Elle McPherson. you're all grown up. When I left Australia, you were just a tiny little thing. And now you're the tiny little thing, aren't you? How does it feel? Lonely. <laughs> well, which is our first award? Clive, this is the award for the Serious Musician of the Year. And it goes to the person who does most to prove that music doesn't have to be some repulsive youth on top of the pops. It could be Nigel Kennedy on top of the pops. Sounds <laughs> thrilling, Elle. Can we first have the runners-up, please? Clive, in third place is Madonna. She achieved what Bach, Mozart, and 
Beethoven couldn't, she posed naked on her hands and knees with her feathers sticking out of her bottom. <laughs> In second place is Elton John. He kept on rocking, even under the crushing burden of his new hair. <laughs> and now for the winner. Elle, will you please open the envelope? <laughs> Clive, the winner of the award for Serious Musician of the Year, a young man who left the Jackson 5 to become the Jackson 1 and finally proved that white man can sing the blues. It's Michael Jackson. <laughs> Michael can't be with us tonight, but uh, <laughs> we're going to go live to him in Los Angeles in just a moment, where he's about to be presented with our award. And this is a replica of the award. It's a valuable and fragile porcelain <laughs> statuette of the patron saint of popular music, and whoops! <laughs> Whoa, let's hope Michael doesn't do that as we go live to Los Angeles, where our BBC representative will present the award. He's carefully handing Michael the priceless award, and uh, whoops! <laughs> uh, he must be running in a new pair of hands. <laughs> More awards later, but for now, thank you, Earl McPherson. The most important date in March was April the 9th, because that was the day chosen by John Major for the next general election. It was clear that the election would mark the end of the Conservative government and quite possibly the end of the Conservative party. John Major and his wife Norma were glad to have the services of their friend Geoffrey Archer, who was now given an important new job. He went everywhere with them on the campaign trail. When the Prime Minister spontaneously took his jacket off at the height of his oratory, Mr. Archer's task was to hold it. <laughs> it happened in every town, and Geoffrey didn't get it wrong once. <laughs> Insiders joked, there could be a peerage in this, Geoffrey. John Major had acquired a rare medical condition which made him wake up in the middle of the night screaming, the forthcoming British economic recovery is a figment of Norman Lamont's warped imagination. <laughs> A political crisis was narrowly averted when a source close to Mr. Major threatened to reveal this to the media. But the Prime Minister moved quickly to silence the potential troublemaker. <laughs> but it was obvious to all that Neil Kinnock and the Labour Party were going to win the election. Already, Mr. Kinnock was spending much of the day in a taxi going round and round Buckingham Palace waiting for the Queen to call him up on his rented cell phone <laughs> and ask him to form a government. <laughs> In the year of the virile politician, Liberal leader Mr Paddy Ashdown based his campaign on his personal potency. He emphasised that he was always ready to embark on a new test of his virility. Oh, I've no doubt that I'm physically up to it. I've done this kind of thing many times before. <laughs> The Conservatives were in such desperate trouble that even Mr Norman Lamont was allowed out on the campaign trail. The Chancellor of the Exchequer called on the only homeowner in southern England whose house was still worth more than his mortgage. <laughs> but unfortunately, the homeowner had emigrated to Australia. <laughs> As April the 9th drew near, the Liberal Democrats, aware that they were going to lose, held their victory rally in advance. Costs for the event soared wildly over budget, even though Mrs. Ashdown's treacle tart raffle force had raised almost 15 pounds. The whole lot was squandered on a dazzling display of an almost complete party box of Brock's mixed fireworks. <laughs> like the blue touch paper and retire, shouted some of Mr. Ashdown's most faithful supporters. <laughs> The Tory party, facing certain defeat, held a pre-election wake. Show business supporters mingled with the politicians, each trying vainly to hide the heartache behind a strained facade of bonhomie. Andrew Lloyd Webber had threatened to leave Britain if Labour won. He now made a bid to swing votes away from the Labour Party by threatening to stay if they won. <laughs> Honest Jim Davidson could not disguise his criticism of John Major's campaign. Fantastic. Uh, it was just, it was just wonderful today, and that speech was great. Perfect, absolutely perfect timing. <laughs>
Supervising the proceedings in the background was Jeffrey Archer in his important new job as the man who stands around pretending to look interested in what a lot of eccentric celebrities have to say about politics. As April the 9th loomed, every newspaper and media outlet in the country predicted an overwhelming Labour victory. So it was only logical that the Labour Party should hold its victory rally before the actual election. A worldwide television audience was gripped from the moment when Neil and Glenis Kinnock made their triumphant entry into the auditorium. Geriatric German observers living in Argentina said that even in the good old days there had never been anything quite like this. <laughs> Neil Kinnock shook hands with acquaintances, total strangers, and a very old friend who remembered the days when Neil was a socialist. <laughs> Celebrities sympathetic to the plight of the poor in Britain beamed in by satellite from their tax shelters abroad. Prominent among them was the noted political philosopher Mr Mick Hucknall of Simply Red. On April the 9th, I'll be voting for Labour in the general election. After that... <laughs> after that, there was nothing left to say, and it was the turn of Neil Kinnock to say it. And now, it is time... Neil Kinnock! Buoyed up by the certainty of victory, the exultant Kinnock launched into his celebrated simultaneous impersonation of Joseph Stalin and Tina Turner. <laughs> Comrades! <laughs> well, all right! After that, the election day itself was an anti-climax, especially when all the votes were counted and it could be seen that the electorate had got it all wrong. But Neil Kinnock had done his job. He had taken the Labour Party from a party that couldn't win to a party that should have won. It was a time for memories. Mr. Michael Heseltine announced the imminent launch of the new British Aerospace Westland Bird's Eye Frozen Foods Toys R Us space probe. <laughs> he gave reporters a graphic demonstration of how the rocket would perform as it carried the hopes of British high technology towards the stars. Whoosh! Sad news for all admirers of the Duke and Duchess of York as the newspapers announced a crisis in their marriage. But the Queen's PR unit made a clever attempt to teach Prince Andrew how to revive his flagging romance. The Duke was persuaded to attend a special demonstration on how the magic can be brought back to marriage by uninhibited yet sophisticated marital techniques. The Duke paid dutiful attention, but was later heard to say that the Duchess had told him she'd already tried that with an American friend of hers, <laughs> and he'd lost all his hair. <laughs> Time now for another quiz question. Both these men have real hair, but only one of them is wanted for questioning about a missing Yorkshire Terrier. <laughs> Which one? Mrs. Margaret Thatcher, now firmly back in the political limelight, told the press that her brand of conservatism was the answer, not just for Britain, but for the whole world. What people say to me more than anything else as I go around is thank you for what you've done for our country. The people who said it to her were the Japanese and the Germans. <laughs>
April, and having lost his seat at the general election, Mr. Chris Patton now learned more about the deep compassion of the Conservative Party. <laughs> Leaving number 10, he got into his official car and found that his official petrol had been officially siphoned off. <laughs> he set off to walk home, where he later found his official carpets had been rolled up and his official wife had been returned to the soft furnishings department of Harvey Nichols. <laughs> Mr. John Major appeared on the doorstep of number 10 to be applauded by all those Tory middle-class mortgage holders who knew that now their party was back in power, their homes would soon be worth more than their mortgages again. I've got my house for the next five years, said John, <laughs> so good luck to you all. <laughs> The Labour Party took their election defeat calmly. Despite press support, Neil Kinnock resigned. The rest of the Labour leadership were unshaken by defeat. They took a bus to Clacton, left a note, and walked into the sea. <laughs> After swimming ashore, Margaret Beckett stood out in her role as deputy leader. She added that dash of excitement that the Labour Party had always needed. Her glamorous personal life was news, especially when she took delivery of a new device designed to make an evening watching television alone more congenial, the inflatable Gerald Kaufman companion doll. <laughs> Modeled on one-time Labor Minister Gerald Kaufman, the inflatable companion doll is made of stain-proof, drip-dry, rubberized latex and comes complete with foot pump. <laughs> Chris Patton was appointed the new governor of Hong Kong. It was a crucial post, but there was no doubt that John Major would miss his friend's support. Patton was his right-hand man, and indeed had shown him how to wave it at the appropriate moment. <laughs> the House of Commons chose its first female speaker, Miss Betty Boothroyd. In her younger days, Miss Boothroyd had been a chorus girl in the kind of place where men drink too much and shout uncontrollably, so she was right at home. <laughs> in Los Angeles, there was a new age concept called retail therapy, which said that people who were in psychological difficulties would feel better if they went shopping. Thousands of people went out to try the new concept of retail therapy and found it worked for them. One retail therapy group member said later, I used to suffer from a small television set. Now I've got a big one. <laughs> In Russia, President Boris Yeltsin addressed his people. The president said that since taking the advice of Mr. Norman Lamont, the Russian economy was in good shape, and people at home should not worry if two men from Access turned up to repossess the furniture. The moment had come for the much-anticipated marriage of exotic Palestinian beauty Yasmin Arafat. Her many male admirers sadly kissed her farewell at a traditional Arab shower party where she proudly described the presents she had received. After the first night of the honeymoon, the world's press was at Yasmin's bedside to ask her how things had gone. Shukran, shukran, shukran. <laughs> Encouraged by agents of the Queen's PR unit, speculation about the friendship between Australian superstar Jason Donovan and the Princess of Wales continued to mount. Arriving at Kensington Palace for a top-secret meeting publicized in advance by the Queen's PR unit, Jason was disappointed to find a note pinned on the door which said, Darling, I had to go and work on my book, OK? Don't be cross. Yours ever, Squidgy. <laughs> time for another award, and that means it's time once again to welcome Elle McPherson.
Oh, you're looking lovelier by the minute. You know, but my agent charges by the second, so we better get on with it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which award is this, Elf? <laughs> Clive, this is a very special award. It's the Nigel Mansell Award for Eloquence. And it goes to the person who most nearly equals Nigel's ability to reduce an audience to a stunned silence. An inspiring thought, Elle. And this award has been so closely contested that it will actually be decided here tonight on the strength of the response of our studio audience. Elle, who is the first nominee for the 1992 Nigel Mansell Award for Eloquence? Well, who else but the master himself, Nigel Mansell. It's, it's the most amazing feeling in your life. And, you know, I've been driving for 30 years. I represented England at the age of nine in carts. And, you know, here I am 30 years later. And, you know, perhaps I can say it. I think I am world champion now. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt that Nigel's well up to speed. L, who is the second nominee? Well, the second nominee is British soccer star Gary Lineker. It's sometimes nice to be at the start of something rather than to join... Something that's been going for a long time, and I think it's a very exciting challenge. <laughs> Gary certainly spoke a blinder there, didn't he? <laughs> and the next nominee? And the third nominee is British tennis star Jeremy Bates. I think the example I've set is that I'm in his mental. And uh, everybody has the, the ability, and uh, it's, uh, you know, and have a self-belief and, uh, and stuff to go out and, and do it. We're, we're all capable of doing it. Well, Earl, you've been judging audience reaction. Which one of our sparkling trios sent the most people to sleep? Well, judging from the audience reaction, Clive, there can be no doubt that the man with his name on the trophy has won it again. So, Earl, for yet another year, the winner of the Nigel Mansell Award for Eloquence is Britain's Formula One barbiturate himself. <laughs> Take a lap of honour, Nigel. And one thing I've learned is that there's only one person that knows the condition of your body and your mind, and that's yourself. And a lot of us don't listen to it. And therefore, uh, I've learned this winter as well with the objectives I've tried to sort of uh, accomplish, that I've got to listen to myself more. <laughs> More awards to come. Until then, thank you, Elle McPherson. <laughs> May and Britain's Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Carey, flew to Rome to meet the Pope. There was an exchange of gifts. Dr. Carey gave the Pope an example of the Church of England's special introductory gift offer to new members, a genuine Ratner's solid pewter-style plastic <laughs> quaffing goblet, certified dishwasher proof. The Pope's gift to Dr. Carey, which he autographed himself, was a book called Pole to Pole, which he bought under the impression that it was the collected correspondence of Lech Wałęsa and Ruler Lenska. <laughs> In Cuba, one of the last of the world's socialist leaders was not giving up on his defiant stance against the capitalist West. Fidel Castro still had the will, and now he had the advanced weapon system. On ceremonial parade, Cuba's rapid response force was a formidable <laughs> sight. Within weeks of an invasion, these advanced vehicles could be out of the repair shop and leaning against the wall of the People's Revolutionary Canned Tomato Distribution Point. The film Basic Instinct successfully explained to the Americans how the British cabinet system works. It showed America how a team of John Major's close advisers chooses a new woman member of his cabinet, quizzing her on her previous relationship with the Prime Minister. You ever tie him up? No. You never tied him up? No. Johnny liked to use his hands too much. <laughs> The two high flyers in the Tory cabinet were Mr. Kenneth Clark and Mr. David Mellor. Brilliant conversations between the two men were detected and recorded by lip readers working for the BBC archive unit. Relaxing after an important cabinet meeting, Mr. Mellor told Mr. Clark about his new scheme to sponsor female Spanish theatrical students living in London. <laughs> Mr. Clark said, it's a challenging project. I suppose so far you're just dipping your toe in the water. <laughs> British rail modernization took a leap forward with the announcement of the new, extremely highly advanced passenger train. A feature of the new, extremely highly advanced passenger train when it comes into service in the next millennium 
will be painted over windows, so the passengers won't be able to tell that the train isn't moving. <laughs> In the Tory cabinet, Mrs. Virginia Bottomley had heard of Mr. David Mellor's scheme to sponsor female Spanish theatrical students living in London and was keen to learn more. Mrs. Bottomley said, I must say I'm inspired by the way you give up your precious free time to visit the Spanish theatrical students one by one and try to help them. I do hope they're grateful. Mr. Mellor replied, some of them are, and some of them try to bite the foot that feeds them. <laughs> President Bush and the Republican Party faced a challenge not just from Mr. Clinton and the Democratic Party. They also faced a Mr. H. Ross Perot, who had no party but lots of money. Perot had already chosen a running mate even smarter than Dan Quayle, a horse called Trigger. <laughs> the Queen's PR unit sent the Prince and Princess of Wales on tour of the Middle East in order to demonstrate their intimacy. He went to Turkey and she went to Egypt. But whatever the doubts about her marriage, there were no doubts about the Princess of Wales' growing stature as a woman genuinely concerned about suffering. On the last day of her tour of Egypt, she attended a folk dancing demonstration, specially shortened to 12 hours, staged by the pupils of the South Cairo School for Young Folk Dancers. After the first three hours of hopping slowly from the left foot to the right foot, the children varied the routine and started hopping slowly from the right foot to the left foot. <laughs> As the afternoon wore on, the Princess of Wales was heard to mutter, I am still concerned with suffering, but I think this time I might have suffered enough. <laughs> Ex-Soviet President Gorbachev and his wife Raisa traveled to California to visit their old friends Ronald and Nancy Reagan, whom they hadn't seen since Reykjavik. President Reagan greeted his visitors with the words, well, if it isn't Reg Kovic, I haven't seen you since Gorbachev. <laughs> then the four friends headed off in different cars for a weekend at the Reagan Ranch. At the ranch, Reagan said, hey, you look just like the guy I met at the airport earlier. <laughs> the most difficult question for a program like ours is what to do when we possess material locked in our safes, which, if broadcast, would undermine the entire constitutional position of the royal family. After much grave deliberation, we have decided that it is our duty to reveal the truth about Prince Charles and an incident in a Devonshire ladies' lavatory. After receiving an anonymous phone call, uniformed officers were called to the lavatory and the prince was taken away for questioning. <laughs> we would like to assure the British public that we would never have released these pictures had we not thought it was in our own financial interest to do so. <laughs> With rumours that he was the Princess of Wales' secret male companion gaining force, Australian superstar Jason Donovan hit the headlines when he was ejected from Harrods, allegedly for being incorrectly dressed. The real reason was revealed by a security camera. Jason had a secret appointment with the Princess of Wales at Harrods' fourth floor beauty parlor and was appalled to find that she'd switched her lip gloss from Avon number no. five to Revlon number no. four. I liked her the way she was. I liked her the way she was! <laughs> June, and in America, the year of the virile politician took a new spurt forward when President Bush, acting on the advice of his tactical team, attended a White House barbecue and pretended to signal to a girl behind his wife's back. Democratic presidential candidate Bill Clinton hit back controversially when he lent his name to the launching of a new product, the Hagen dazs Yogulik frozen yogurt log. Yum, yum, said Clinton. This Yogulik frozen yogurt tastes almost as good as it would if I spread it all over my wife. <laughs> President Bush's new campaign manager, James Baker, taught his boss the art of not giving anything away when asked a difficult question. Baker was asked, are you the kind of man who can be seen on a Washington sidewalk at three in the morning, wearing a wet look miniskirt and ankle strap high heels and swinging a handbag at passing cars? Hey, if I was, you don't think I'd talk about it now, do you? <laughs> in Britain, it was National Music Day and the country was regaled by a wealth of hitherto unknown musical talent. Oh, <laughs> there was 
a spirited performance of Spanish music by the minister in charge of sponsoring female Spanish theatrical students in London, Mr. David Mellor. Mr. Mellor wielded a Spanish tambourine as if he'd been taught to bang it against his leg by an expert. <laughs> Which brings us to our next quiz question. Ready? Here it comes. Both these men are young, handsome and musical, but only one of them takes his socks off to sing A Viva España. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> Russian President Mr. Boris Yeltsin went to America hoping to borrow money to pay the interest on his American Express account against which he had charged Russia's access bill. He traveled by Aeroflot and after a successful landing near Washington Airport, he gave the press details of his flight. <laughs> yes. There were far too many live chickens traveling first class, he said. And a stewardess that size should not have been allowed to sit in the pilot's lap. <laughs> On the eve of President Yeltsin's triumphant return to his country, he and President Bush went for a cruise on the presidential launch. A note of informality was struck as Yeltsin casually discarded Russia's only tie. <laughs> he was a happy man. He'd got what he came for, a $10 billion loan and all the loose change in President Bush's trouser pockets. <laughs> Nothing could stop the relentless onrush of the forthcoming British economic recovery. Mr. Norman Lamont said it would happen tomorrow, and Mr. Major was unequivocal in backing him up. I think many people have imagined this is the beginning and the end of the process, but it isn't, of course. It's the beginning of the end of the negotiations, but then the negotiations have to be carried into effect. So I do see this as the start of a continuing process over many years. <laughs> President Bush's election campaign moved into high gear when Vice President Dan Quayle launched an intensive personal investigation into the standard of spelling in the nation's schools. Mr. Quayle did well until a small mistake was magnified out of all proportion by the media. And add, add one little bit on the end. Just think of potato. How's it? So, you write phonetically. What else? There you go. I've always had a problem with spelling, the vice president said afterwards. When I applied to go to Vietnam, I spelled it T-E-X-A-S. <laughs> there was more controversy over maverick presidential candidate H. Ross Perot when it was revealed that his employees were not allowed to go to the lavatory during working hours. Time spent in the toilet was time wasted, said Perot, and he himself, during his entire career, had never spent any time there. I never spent a minute, I never spent a second, I never spent a penny. <laughs> London and the Queen Mother took the Princess of Wales for a very private carriage drive. The Queen Mother said, do let me know how you and Charles are getting along these days, because I've got five to four at Ladbrokes that the next King of England will be Geoffrey Archer. <laughs> In Russia, President Boris Yeltsin and his brother Horace went on holiday to the Black Sea Resort where, as young men, they used to go fishing together. Boris and Horace Yeltsin discovered that the fishing was not what it used to be. The president, using all his old guile, did make a catch, but she was far too small for a Russian leader, so he threw her back. <laughs> In the birthday honours list, Geoffrey Archer at last received the recognition due to a man who has held the Prime Minister's jacket above and beyond the call of duty. To those who suggested that the honour was perhaps a trifle excessive, Lord Archer reacted with his customary self-deprecating humour. You only get the whingers, grumblers and cynics making these sort of pathetic <laughs> observations. <laughs> Britain was in the grip of a new and dangerous craze, all-night parties, called raves, in which young people danced themselves to a frenzy under the influence of a drug called ecstasy. <laughs> ecstasy is both addictive and dangerous, and it gives the user feelings of power which in real life they don't possess. <laughs> Broadcasting and the new Sky Television situation comedy Life with the Maxwells got off to an uproarious start. But first, a recap. Dad's overdue from his summer holiday away from it all. And that means young Kevin's in big trouble. Like so many young homeowners in Britain, he and his upmarket wife, Pandora, owe the government 400 million pounds. Whoops. But now the fun really begins. Early one morning, even before the Daily Star has been delivered, 
two strange men knock at the door, but plucky Pandora is soon at the upstairs window to tell them to make themselves scarce. Piss off, you don't get up for an hour. <laughs> I am about to call the police. Morning, we are the police. Yeah. Yeah. Time for another award, and here to present it, please welcome back Elle McPherson. <laughs> Elle, do all Australian girls look like you nowadays? Well, yes, but most Australian men still look like you. <laughs> Thank you, Elle. Well, which award is this? Now, Clive, this is the World Peace Award, which goes to the person who does most for love and understanding, and it's worth so much, people kill each other to win it. A moving thought, Elle. <laughs> May we first hear the runners-up? Clive, in third place is Antonia de Sancha. She took pity on an unknown man, handicapped by his looks and personality, <laughs> and taught him to stand on his own two feet, even though one of them felt slightly dabbed. <laughs> in second place is John Smith. A man with a suit as exciting as his name, he reminded England that there was another land to the north, a rich land called Norway. <laughs> and now for the winner. Elle, will you please open the envelope? Clive, the winner of the World Peace Award is... Nelson Mandela. <laughs> Mr. Mandela can't be with us tonight, but in a moment we're going live to Johannesburg for the presentation of the award. It's a diploma which has been put in a special box like this by the South African government as a token of how sorry they are for having persecuted him in the past. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real <laughs> uh, More awards are still to come. Meanwhile, thank you, Earl McPherson. July, and a senior government minister's innocent sponsorship of a female Spanish theatrical student led to a wholly irresponsible smear campaign by the Fleet Street tabloids. In actual fact, Mr. Mellor had met Mr. Sancha only to discuss sponsorship details and to see whether he'd left a sock behind on his last visit. <laughs> when interviewed, Mr. Sancha first made remarks which suggested she might have been going out with Mr. Norman Lamont. It's nice to be going out with someone that's in control of things. <laughs> Mr. Sancha had every right to be outraged at the press allegations about her character. She defended herself vigorously. The truth was, she was a hard-working professional who soon leapt to further fame in her own right in a commercial for Bendix Bitter Mint's new line of non-bitter bitter mints. In the commercial, Antonia played a suave international confectionery sampler who goes to the theatre just after eating six one-pound boxes of Bendix Better Non-Bitter Bitter Mints. She is asked whether she has any digestive problems. Uh, everything's fine, thank you. Any yeah. bitterness? <laughs> British footballer Gary Lineker arrived in Japan to join the Japanese Football League. No sooner was Lineker off the plane than Hideyoshi Sokotumi, Japanese television's version of Jeremy Paxman, submitted him to a probing, in-depth interview. Mr. Lineker, welcome to Nagoya. Thank you. How are you feeling? Feeling fine. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> the BBC launched a new soap opera called El Dorado, which was an immediate smash hit. It was not true that it had no fans. The fan lived in Libya, and he watched every episode on video in his tent with dated breath. Then he tuned in by video box from Tripoli to say it was the best soap he'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
On the day of her official confirmation as deputy leader of the Labour Party, Margaret Beckett had to face a challenge which might have made other women turn and run. She had to kiss Roy Hattersley. <laughs> For the benefit of the television cameras, Miss Beckett's inflatable Gerald Kaufman companion doll was now put to a new use. Its task was to, <laughs> its task was to listen to Mr. John Smith's speeches with appropriate enthusiasm. <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher paid a visit to America to encourage George Bush in his campaign for re-election to the presidency by attending his meetings, sitting in the audience, and jumping up to offer him useful advice. The degree of Mr. Bush's gratitude to Mrs. Thatcher was obvious. Would you please be quiet and let me finish? <laughs> Would you please shut up and sit down? <laughs> President Bush reassured the American people that his vice president, Dan Quayle, had a solid background as a fried chicken franchise assistant manager, skilled at taking telephone orders for well-seasoned chicken burgers that used every part of the chicken, even the giblets. And the American people need to know that the man who answers that phone has the experience, the seasoning, the guts to do the right thing. Maverick presidential candidate H. Ross Perot was advised that he couldn't re-enter the presidential race at the last minute unless he withdrew first. Thank heavens I entered in the first place, said Perot, or I wouldn't be able to withdraw in order to re-enter. <laughs> Democratic presidential candidate Bill Clinton met Mr. Nelson Mandela of South Africa, which leads us to another quiz question. Both these men have suspicious wives, but only one of the wives knew exactly where her husband was for 26 years. <laughs> Which one? Medicine, and from the world's most advanced plastic surgery clinic in California's Santa Monica Mountains, three grateful patients returned by helicopter to Los Angeles. First off was Mr. Kirk Douglas. Kirk said, one of my eyes is still a bit loose, but I think this makes me look the way I feel inside. <laughs> then came Nancy Reagan. Nancy said she hadn't felt so young since Abraham Lincoln kissed her at his inauguration. <laughs> and finally, the pièce de résistance, after some last-minute adjustments, came the clinic's most striking success, Robert Maxwell. <laughs> my plan worked, he said. August, and the Olympic Games took place in Barcelona. Britain was stunned when the British Cox pairs stroked their way to victory and the gold medal. The British lads were deeply moved as sponsorship money poured in, and they realized that now they might not have to row home after all. <laughs> A guest commentator at the Barcelona Olympics was Gary Lineker, who was asked by the BBC anchorman Desmond Lynham whether the England soccer team's new 4-4-2 formation would make any impression on a packed Norwegian defence. Des was fascinated by Gary's answer. Well, a little bit. It all really goes back to the Civil War here when um, Franco Spain um, oppressed a lot of other parts of Spain and Catalonia being one of them. They didn't allow them to speak their own language and, of course, they tried to fight back. And ever since those days, although Franco's now gone, um, Catalonia is still... <laughs> its independence and its nationality, and they regard themselves as their own country. <laughs> A welcome addition to the competing Olympic nations in Barcelona was Mongolia. The Mongolian three-man rape and pillage relay team <laughs> won the hearts of all. <laughs> yes, they all came to Barcelona. All those who had given their lives to sport with no hope of reward except the satisfaction of knowing that they had done their best.
The Queen's PR unit had a plan to mend the Duchess of York's ailing marriage. In order to reawaken Andrew's interest, they ordered the Duchess to make the supreme sacrifice and take a holiday. In the south of France, the PR unit set up a scene of pretended intimacy around a swimming pool. They supplied a man from an American escort agency whose range of wigs had been diverted to Charles de Gaulle Airport. <laughs> it was hell, Fergie said later. Would you believe it? The wind blew away my bikini top just as Lord Snowden was taking the official photograph for our family Christmas card. <laughs> but the Queen was no longer in a mood to accept excuses, and Fergie was forbidden to attend the Queen Mother's birthday party. The Queen Mother said later, Where's that large red-headed girl who's always throwing cakes at the corgis? <laughs> anyway, happy birthday to me. <laughs> As the American election approached, a damaging split occurred between the president and his vice president when they were asked to react to the Democrats' election platform. The president said this. I was struck by the fact that the other party took words to put together their platform but left out three simple letters, G, O, D. But the vice president said, That is wrong. He said that the word God had four letters. There should be an E on the end. <laughs> president Bush called him a stupid sod. <laughs> Democratic presidential candidate Bill Clinton made it clear that God was part of his platform. On his way to church, he asked God for a sign, some little indication of divine approval of the sure but steady path he was climbing on the way to the White House. <laughs> Taking a leaf out of Mr. Major's book, President Bush took his jacket off in public, but he failed to realize that there was no point in taking off his jacket if Jeffrey Archer was not there to receive it. <laughs> Jeffrey started running the moment the jacket began to come off, but being 3,000 miles away, he only reached his living room door. <laughs> Ex-President Ronald Reagan remained a force in American politics. That mind of his was as sharp as ever. He was asked, could he say the phrase, four more years, without fluffing it? Yes. Was he sure? Yes. Sure? Yes. Sure? Four year, years, more years. <laughs> In Britain, there was a further misunderstanding over the marriage of the Prince and Princess of Wales. To distract attention from this, the Queen's PR unit staged the Queen Mother's birthday all over again. The Queen Mother said, What happened to that lovely, tall Spencer girl who kept falling down the stairs? I liked her. Anyway, happy birthday to me again. <laughs> Prime Minister John Major appeared at a press conference held to unveil the Conservative Party's answer to Labour's inflatable Gerald Kaufman companion. It was the inflatable Douglas Hurd doll, <laughs> everyone's favourite dummy foreign secretary. In cricket, England's great rivals Pakistan were alleged to have interfered with the ball. English players complained, it's not fair, they keep hitting our ball over the fence. <laughs> Still vainly denying that he was the Princess of Wales' secret male companion, blonde Australian superstar Jason Donovan was arrested climbing over the wall of Kensington Palace. He fobbed off the press with his explanation that he was a freelance coping stone repairer and he had been busy repairing the coping on the palace wall. I cope really well. I actually cope um, a lot better than everybody probably thought I was going to cope. <laughs> Time now for another award for 1992, and here to present it, welcome again, Elle McPherson. <laughs> Elle, what are you doing after the show? Well, actually, Mel Gibson's sending me his private jet, and we're going off for skiing a couple of weeks in Colorado. Can I come? Well, Elle, which award is this? <laughs> Clive, this is the very special Margaret Thatcher Foundation Award. And it's for the woman of decision, and it goes to the married woman who knows what to do with what she's got to get what she wants when she wants it. 
That's inspiring, Hill. <laughs> Can we have the runners-up, please? In third place is Mia Farrow. Although not technically a wife, she behaved like one when the girl who was not technically her daughter ran off with the man who was not technically her husband. <laughs> In second place is Norma Major. She stuck faithfully by her husband even when she found out what terrible things he did during the day. <laughs> and now for the winner. Elle, will you please open the envelope? Clive, the winner of the award for the Woman of Decision for refusing to let the old stuffy institution like the royal family come between her and the throne is the Princess of Wales. The princess can't be with us tonight. <laughs> the royals are having a family get-together, so she's at San Lorenzo with Kevin Costner. <laughs> Here's a replica of her award. It's this beautifully mounted head of the only remaining Nepalese ibex, shot specially by Prince Philip. It was presented to the princess earlier today during a visit she paid to the almost finished British Library at King's Cross. As the princess toured the almost finished library, she was escorted by the Cray twins out on parole. <laughs> then she was presented with our award with the suggestion that it would make an excellent hood ornament for her next Mercedes when she drove it at high speed through a crowd of journalists. <laughs> More awards later. Meanwhile, thank you again, Elle McPherson. September, and with the American election now only a month away, President Bush and Governor Clinton remain front runners. But the unfortunate effect of both campaigns hiring the same speechwriter was beginning to show. I will do what Harry Truman did. I am going to do what Harry Truman did. The buck stops here. The buck stops here. <laughs> Under pressure, President Bush now made his big mistake. He alienated an important section of the electorate. It is time to make people more important than owls. <laughs> After that, no owl would vote for him. And a campaign in favor of Clinton was launched by a Republican pressure group called Owls of Protest. <laughs> but Clinton's biggest advantage was his wife, Hillary, who made it very clear she wasn't there just to nod in agreement every second time her husband said something. But ahead to invest and educate... She nodded every time her husband said something. <laughs> in Britain, Mr. Major moved on to his first experience of one of the most challenging fixtures in the British Prime Minister's social calendar. It was the annual dinner of the Rabbi Burns Wahe the Broar Brick Moonlich Nick to Nick Dram Bui Appreciation Club. <laughs> Certain subtle signs told the keen-eyed Mr. Major that the club had a Scottish connection. <laughs> the Prime Minister caused a sensation when he confidently drained the contents of his finger bowl. <laughs> As part of his strategy for the forthcoming British economic recovery, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Mr. Norman Lamont, then pulled off his biggest coup to date a planned withdrawal from the ERM. Our cameras were there for the actual moment when Mr. Lamont accomplished his historic U-turn. <laughs> On the advice of the Queen's PR unit, Prince Edward visited London's Chinese community and was introduced to a symbolic dragon. The symbolic dragon spoke to the prince in symbolic dragon language. It said, you should find a nice girl and settle down before you lose all your hair. <laughs> and don't put too much faith in this show business caper. There used to be 46 other guys under here with us, but then we lost our Arts Council grant. Have you got Andrew Lloyd Webber's phone number? <laughs> Time for another quiz question. One of these men is absolutely terrified about standing next to the other one. <laughs> which? Which is which? 
Things were looking better for the Labour Party. The annual conference was marked by a stunning performance from its star personality. The inflatable Gerald Kaufman companion doll <laughs> registered every aspect of the party's passionate concern over the state of the nation. Anger. <laughs> Outrage. <laughs> Sympathy. <laughs> Determination. <laughs> Contempt. <laughs> Horror. In Italy, playing now for Lazio, British soccer star Paul Gazza Gascoigne was making friends amongst his warm-blooded Latin teammates. He soon learned that subtle Italian way of expressing masculine companionship. <laughs> American singing star Michael Jackson resumed his world tour after a major surgical operation to have a certain intimate part of his anatomy replaced with a food mixer. He was clearly still in some discomfort, but his omelettes were said to be marvellous. <laughs> As the American election drew closer, President Bush sent Vice President Quayle on an urgent trip to Japan with instructions to come back as soon as he'd learned the language. At a state welcoming ceremony, Japanese Prime Minister Mr. Miyazawa addressed the nation with a tribute to Mr. Quayle. Sengo. British politics and Mr. Major's other great coup in this year of the virile politician was to establish beyond doubt that one of his top ministers was not only involved with a female Spanish theatrical student, he was also involved with a blonde Palestinian millionaires who was closely related to exotic Palestinian beauty Yasmin Arafat on her camel's side. <laughs> for Mr. Mellor, this was the break he'd been looking for. He now made the big jump from politics to show business. Deeply, deeply about the curve you got Deeply hot, hot for the curves you got. Deeply dippy about the fun we had. Deeply mad, mad for the fun we had. Oh, my love, I can't make head nor tail of passion. Oh, my love, let's set sail for seas of passion. Dippy about your Spanish eyes Sierra smile <laughs> Legs that go on for miles and miles Oh, see those legs, man Miles and miles October and Mr. Major, after triumphantly steering the British economy away from decline and into disaster, was warmly congratulated by Mrs. Thatcher at the Tory party conference. Friends close by heard their touching terms of endearment. Cretan, she whispered. <laughs> Silly cow, he replied. <laughs> but in this year of the virile politician, the real hit of the party conference was Mr. Michael Heseltine, who, after the enforced retirement of Mr. Mellor, made a bid for the title of most virile politician on the government front bench with this stirring claim about how frequently he tested his virility. Before breakfast, before lunch, before tea, and before dinner. In America, all eyes were on the presidential election, which brings us to another quiz question. All ready? Here it is. One of these men is happy because he knows he's winning, one is happy because he doesn't know he's losing, and one is happy because last night he sank every plastic duck in his bath with a nickel-plated Colt 45. <laughs> which is which? Pop star Madonna released a book of erotica called Sex. The most shocking photograph in a shocking book was of Madonna sucking the toe of an unnamed senior British conservative politician. <laughs> Everyone guessed that the unknown recipient of Madonna's favours was Mr. David Mellor. Mr. Edward Heath was the only one who realized that the lucky foot actually belonged to someone else. Well, I think uh, the members of our party and uh, the members of the British public will now 
realize exactly what Lady Thatcher is like. <laughs> and now, a romance. To people everywhere, the name of one British city evokes the exotic, the sensual, the whisper of promise. Yes, it was to Birmingham that the European <laughs> leaders came to discuss Maastricht, since the even more boring alternative was to go to Maastricht to discuss Birmingham. <laughs> Mr. Major's most brilliant move of the conference was his tactful remark to President Mitterrand of France after the President's recent prostate operation. Mr. Major asked, would you be more comfortable standing up? Mr. Mitterrand muttered, I am standing up. <laughs> News of the British Labour Party's hugely successful inflatable Gerald Kaufman companion had reached China, where Chinese scientists rapidly developed the inflatable Deng Xiaoping walking and waving very old leader doll. In America, on the eve of polling day, Vice President Quayle gave a key address at a convention of American lectern builders in a Washington health club, where he told the assembled builders of lecterns that the solid and durable American lectern was a symbol of everything the Bush administration had to offer. I feel right at home in this gymnasium. <laughs> Just in time to help sweep the president back into office, Vice President Quayle had put the potato incident behind him and was revealing a new mastery of the English language. The president will do very, very well. He will uh, conduct himself uh, very presidential-like. <laughs> but uh, Bill Clinton wasn't through yet. His campaign was based on shaking the hand of everyone in the USA at least once. At a vegetable market, he shook hands with the people selling vegetables. He then proceeded to shake hands with the people buying vegetables. He tried to shake hands with the vegetables, but they were registered Republican voters. On polling day, the Democratic owls ate the Republican vegetables alive. Bill Clinton was over the top and into the White House. H. Ross Perot was merely over the top, and George Bush was in the doghouse. In Russia, President Yeltsin was humiliating ex-President Gorbachev by continually replacing his official car with a smaller one. Gorbachev started off with a zim, then he had a zil, and now he had a zit. <laughs> Mr. Yeltsin said his predecessor could count himself lucky. <laughs> Television and a special edition of Mastermind tested the intelligence of leading British politicians. The first contestant was Mr. Major, who scored the maximum on his chosen special subject, the rules of cricket, but did less well on general knowledge. He was asked, when will it be Boxing Day? It will either be before Christmas or immediately after. <laughs> Mr. Norman Lamont, after scoring a disastrous zero on his chosen subject, economics, did better on general knowledge. He was asked why he hadn't known that the Germans had privately decided that the British pound was worth less than the Central African Republic's dried banana. I am, in fact, only the Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> Finally, Mr. Hesseltine did well on his chosen subject, the hairstyles of Michael Hesseltine, and did equally well on general knowledge. He was asked to explain why he regarded Mr. Jacques Delors' conduct as untrustworthy. Mr. Delors is uh, French. <laughs> Time now for another award, and here to present it, will you welcome again, Elle McPherson. <laughs> I knew a girl just like you once. I used to take her to the pictures. <laughs> it was my mother, Clive. You used to meet her inside and you used to make her pay for the ice cream. Well, those Rudolph Valentino movies were expensive. <laughs> no, which award is this? Clive, this is the award for the political hero of the year. And it goes to the man or woman who has most succeeded in putting back into their office some of the integrity they sacrificed to get elected in the first place. A heartwarming thought, Elle. Can we have the runners-up, please? <laughs> Clive, in third place is Neil Kinnock. 
Once a mere leader of the Labour Party, he rose from nothing to become a Radio 2 disc jockey. <laughs> In second place is David Miller. He bestrode the political scene like a colossus, with one foot in his mouth and one foot in hers. <laughs> and now, the winner. Elle, will you please open the envelope? Clive, the winner of the award for Political Hero of the Year. He's the next President of the United States and the previous winner of the Little Rock School of Music Junior Trophy for blowing the saxophone without inhaling. <laughs> it's Bill Clinton. Bill can't be with us tonight because his wife's in hospital for an operation to have a frozen yogurt carton removed. <laughs> but, but this is a replica of the trophy. It's a jar of Ronald Reagan choice-making beads. And we're going live to Washington now where the man who invented the beads is going to tell the winner how they work. We appear to have lost sound, but I think Mr. Reagan is saying that he used to close his eyes and reach into the jar, and if he picked a white bead, he cut taxes, and if he picked a blue bead, he cut welfare, and if he picked a red bead, he launched a nuclear first strike at any country whose name he could pronounce. <laughs> and we're getting sound back now. Thank you, what a wonderful gift. I love it. I'll need them. <laughs> More awards to come. Until then, thank you, Elle McPherson. <laughs> November and Maastricht this month was in Oxfordshire. Once again, Prime Minister Major and Chancellor Cole were slugging it out at the top. When Chancellor Cole told his traditional German joke about Warren Beatty, Madonna, and the embarrassing German ferret-like animal called the Drobelauf, <laughs> Mr. Major responded with typical British restraint. Also, das erste nehmen Sie jetzt als ein Probelauf. Okay. <laughs> Do it again. Yeah. <laughs> a potentially embarrassing situation for the British government arose when it was revealed that three businessmen who were being tried for selling arms to Iraq had been doing so with government approval. But a government spokesman said it wouldn't matter if they were convicted because in a British court to be found guilty is proof of innocence. <laughs> There was no truth to the rumour that the minister responsible, Mr. Kenneth Clark, was suffering from paranoia. He only wore a flak jacket while gardening because he had recently been attacked by a hedgehog with a £30,000 mortgage on a hole now worth only £5,000. <laughs> <laughs> Chancellor of the Exchequer, Norman Lamont, as part of his strategy for the forthcoming British economic recovery, had been constantly moving house, usually at midnight in a plain van. He was distressed to find that his access bills failed to keep up with his frequent changes of address and off license. <laughs> Mr. Lamont was extremely concerned about the situation. He told his old friend, Mr. Douglas Hurd, all about it. Mr. Hurd said, I agree with you, Norman. You're in deep trouble. Goodbye. <laughs> Time now for one of our regular quiz questions. Pencils ready? Here it comes. One of these men can run a hundred meters in ten seconds, and the other may need to shortly. <laughs> which is which? The General Synod of the Church of England produced the biggest bust-up since the Reformation. Women were finally admitted to the priesthood. Mrs. Margaret Thatcher was the first to hail this breakthrough. She unveiled a portrait of her personal tip for the next Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> Here goes then. <laughs> The royal family now had more troubled marriages than it had members, and the Queen's PR unit staged a masterly diversion. It successfully burned down Windsor Castle. <laughs> the event provided a golden opportunity for Prince Andrew to establish a rapport with the press. I'm only here to answer questions, all right? We're not going to say anything. <laughs> With his guard down, this was the chance for the press to ask Prince Andrew whether he had at least enjoyed his honeymoon with the Duchess of York. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know because I was not there. <laughs> President and Mrs. Boris Yeltsin were once again in London, 
under the impression that Britain had some money to lend. At the welcoming ceremony, Mr. Yeltsin spotted Mrs. Thatcher, where Mr. Major had hidden her amongst a stack of battle axes. <laughs> Mr. Yeltsin told Mrs. Thatcher, it perks me up just to see you. I've been feeling very drowsy lately. <laughs> Mrs. Yeltsin said, thank you for recommending those pills you give your husband. They work for mine, too. <laughs> After a successful visit, the Yeltsins prepared to return to Russia. The first part of the journey home was up a perfectly safe set of British Airways steps. The rest of the trip, by Aeroflot, would be more of a hazard. <laughs> so, Mrs. Yeltsin was understandably nervous and forgot to wave goodbye. Attempting to rectify her mistake, she was crushed by her husband. <laughs> She later completed the journey in a magazine rack. <laughs> Britain's ace football manager, Graham Taylor, was revealing himself to have the kind of strategic brain otherwise unavailable except in the Queen's PR unit. We seem to have had problems getting what I call the second goal. <laughs> getting the first goal would have made the problem easier, but you can't expect the impossible. English football had a new genius available, Mr Vinnie Jones. Vinny, being an affectionate short form for the word vindictive, <laughs> it was only natural that he should star in a video explaining how English football had earned its worldwide reputation. The one where you, you follow in a play and he passes the ball off. Everybody follows the ball and then you just come in and follow down with your studs on the back of his Achilles down the calf. It's always a nice one. Madonna released a new video even more shocking than her last video. This one was called Erotica, and it appalled even those who didn't see it. What few people knew was there was an even steamier version of the tape, which Madonna had made with some of her kinkier friends. We managed to obtain a copy from a man in Soho with pointed shoes. <laughs> if you get your children to face the other way and blindfold grandma, here it is. December, and the Queen's PR unit made strenuous efforts to get the Prince and Princess of Wales back together so that they could separate. <laughs> the Princess of Wales immediately went into group therapy. Her fellow patients <laughs> were a Mr. Geoffrey Archer and a Mr. Dennis Healy, who were suffering from the delusion that they were Father Christmas. <laughs> Prince Charles was pleased to attend a British Museum exhibition of royal memorabilia. The exhibition included the preserved heads of past princesses who had displeased their royal husbands. <laughs> One of the tragic royal ladies was Princess Squidgeetha, who defied the wishes of Prince Ethelred the Appalling and purchased the Mercedes chariot. <laughs> the other was Princess Fergitha, who brained her husband with a bread roll and ran off with a bald barbarian. <laughs> The year of the virile politician was over, but nobody had told George Bush. He was still pretending to wave at girlfriends when his wife wasn't looking. <laughs> the defeated Mr. Bush was still president, but in name only. And he now had to suffer the greatest humiliation of all. He had come to the point where not even Britain's John Major could be bothered to shake hands with him.
with the British economic recovery on its way, it was only fitting that Mr. Major should be sent a Christmas gift from his Chancellor. Norman's been to the off-license again, says <laughs> Mr. Major with a grim smile. The Queen's PR unit announced that Princess Anne would shortly remarry. There remained the question of who would be the husband. The Princess Royal auditioned members <laughs> of the Parachute Regiment. She was interested in someone who was tall and liked horses. Those who liked horses were too short, and those who were the right height said they were mainly interested in six-foot-tall Australian supermodels. <laughs> so the Princess decided to marry a sailor instead. <laughs> the year of the British economic recovery ended on a high note for British technology, when Mr Major toured an electronics factory and was shown the new British CD player, which it was hoped would actually be on the market before it was obsolete. Mr. Major was puzzled. How can I get my Lonnie Donegan 12-inch LP in that? <laughs> and where do you wind it up? <laughs> so, what had happened to the world in 1992? Back in January, you'll remember, the Godfathers appeared to have the world sewn up tighter than Madonna's clenched buttocks. <laughs> But in only 12 months, the forthcoming world economic recovery had put the skids under one godfather after another. Gentleman George Bushinsky had been bumped off by some hick from Arkansas. <laughs> Johnny the Gimp Major had been sold up the river by Norman Badger Lamont. <laughs> Boris Potatoes Yeltsin was wanted for income tax evasion in 46 separate ex-Soviet states. <laughs> And Mr. Mickey the Mouse Miyazawa from Tokyo was saying that if things got any worse, he would have to sell New York. <laughs> that left just Helmut the Hitman Cole and Scarface Frank Mitterrand. And the only reason they had any money left was they were stealing it from each other. <laughs> People nowadays got no respect, said the Hitman. Whatever happened to Machine Gun Margaret, said Scarface Frank. <laughs> now, with faraway Big Ben almost ready to strike midnight, it's time to announce our major awards for Man and Woman of the Year. And here to assist me for the last time tonight, unless I get very lucky, is... <laughs> is Elle McPherson. Sorry about the innuendo, Elle. That's all right, Clive. I know it's just a cry for help from a sad, lonely, and tormented old man. <laughs> You're a compassionate woman, Elle. <laughs> Would you please read out the names of the runners-up for Woman of the Year 1992? Well, Clive, in fourth place is Madonna. For writing a book about sex that will persuade many young people to save themselves for marriage, or indeed forever. <laughs> In third place is Antonia de Sancha. For getting the bit between her teeth that left David Mellor without a leg to stand on. <laughs> In second place is the Princess of Wales. For helping to prove that true love means sharing. One palace for him, one palace for her. <laughs> and now, Elle, will you please open the envelope which contains the name of the winner, our 1992 Woman of the Year. The woman of the year for keeping her chin up even when her castle burned down and for demonstrating that with the right public relations, it doesn't matter how your relations behave in public, is Her Majesty the Queen. Her Majesty can't be with us tonight. She's at, <laughs> she's at the other Balmoral, the one in Scotland, giving a farewell party for her PR unit, whom she's sending off for a well-earned holiday, shark wrestling in the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> but let's show everyone our special duplicate of the award she has won. Well, this is it. It's a combined ceremonial mace, ashtray, and electric journalist prod. <laughs> <laughs> and earlier today, in the cosy, lesser reception room at Balmoral, Scotland, the Woman of the Year Award was presented to Her Majesty by the Executive Committee of the Jason Donovan Fan Club. <laughs> Regrettably, Her Majesty turned it down. 
When asked why, the Queen's PR unit explained, we told her she might have to pay tax on it. <laughs> And now, Earl, it's time to read out the names of the nominees for the title Man of the Year. Yes, Clive, in fourth place is Ross Perot. For proving that in America anyone can get to be president, unless they're a crazy little billionaire from Texas. <laughs> in third place is John Bryan. For giving the Duchess of York financial advice by word of mouth without choking on toenail polish. <laughs> in second place is Norman Lamont for proving that even our greatest statesmen can get into a really rather charming muddle over trivial financial matters, such as the British economy. <laughs> and now, Earl, will you please open the envelope which contains the name of our winner of the 1992 Man of the Year. He's the choice of the people in a great democracy and a youthful symbol of vigor for the whole world. Yes, of course, the man of the year is Jason Donovan. Well, wow. <laughs> Jason doesn't seem to be with us tonight. I told him where we were, but he hasn't shown up. But we are ready now to roll some suitable tributes to a great Australian. Our man of the year for 1992, Jason Donovan. And we begin with the Emperor of Japan. Everybody who meets him says how much they like him. I always feel wonderful when I get to talk about the strongest, the most decent, the most caring, the wisest, yes, and the healthiest man I know. And those were only some of the tributes to our man of the year, Jason Donovan. What a shame it is that he couldn't find the time to be here at Balmoral tonight. It looks like it's just you and me, Elle. Well, at least with you, I'm safe from any form of physical attraction. <laughs> That's good to know, Elle. <laughs> and now, with time running out fast, we go over to London for the midnight chimes of Big Ben. But we'll be straight back to seeing Old Lang Syne, so see you in 1993. Happy New Year, Elle. And Happy you oh. New Year to you, too. Oh. And it's really tough that Jason can't be here. The one thing we need is a young, handsome Australian to come striding in and distract you from the mature <laughs> time. You bastard. He sent me to Balmoral in Scotland, right? And it was very embarrassing turning up there to find no one kissing under the mistletoe except a couple of corgis. Well, Jason, I didn't want Earl to be distracted. I know she has a deep affection for you. Well, I wouldn't say that. It's just that when he sings, as time goes by, I simply feel the urge to grab onto a big, strong man. Jason, why don't you stay here and sing as time goes by while I take her over there? Ladies and gentlemen, our man of the year, Jason Donovan.
Thank you, Jason. That was terrific, I must admit. And now it's time to sing Old Lang Syne, the song we all sing once a year. And Clive, you must have sung it at least a hundred times. <laughs> I've only heard it a few times, Clive. Heard it times, but, uh... Follow me, children. It goes like this. Well, now, with 1993 just a few minutes old, we join the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Most Reverend Dr George Carey, as he shares his hopes for the new year. Hello. This is a very special room in Lambeth Palace. It's known as Cranmer's Room, named after Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. He lived here 450 years ago. He's best remembered for the work he did in producing the church's first general prayer book. When Cramer died, he probably thought that much of his life's work had been in vain. His church and his nation were struggling through one of the most turbulent periods of their history. 
1992 has also been a turbulent year.